And I think, and that the idea that I've been proposing to you is that what evolved mythology does, these representations that we've been dealing with, these archetypal representations, is sketch out that landscape. What, are, what is the landscape of playable games? That's a good way of thinking about it. And so it's, it sets out a landscape, it's, it sets out a description of the landscape in which the game is going to be played, as well as a description of the, lands, of, of the game itself. And so the landscape is roughly, the, 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 core, the core archetype seems to be something like it's, it's, it's something like the interplay between chaos and order. And chaos is represented by <clears throat> the serpentile predator, because we use our predator detection circuits to conceptualize the unknown, because <clears throat> what else would we do? It, that, that, that seems, <coughs> given that we're prey animals and given our evolutionary history, it's very difficult to understand what else we would possibly do. Because the critical issue about venturing into the unknown is that you might die. Or perhaps a slight variant of that is something might kill you. But whatever, those are close enough to the same thing. So chaos is what causes your deterioration and death. And there's lots of ways to conceptualize that. But, but uh, reptilian predator, fire-breathing reptilian predator isn't a bad way to start. And so the question is, well, what do you do in the face of that? And one answer is you build circumscribed enclosures. That's order. And then also you act as the builder of circumscribed enclosures. So that's partly the hero. Now the hero is also, though, that's not good enough because the circumscribed enclosure isn't impermeable. It can be invaded. It will inevitably be invaded, either from the outside or from within, right? And so we've been conceptualizing the, the, the predator, the malevolent predator, at multiple levels of analysis throughout our evolutionary history, say, but also in our symbolic history, trying to understand the nature of that which invades the enclosure, right? And we can say, well, it's partly external threat, it's partly social threat, but it's also partly the threat that each individual brings to bear on the social structure because of our, let's say, our intrinsic malevolence. And so that would be the snakes within. And so that accounts for the analogy, the, the Christian analogy between the serpent in the Garden of Eden and Satan, which is a very, very strange analogy. It's not obvious at all why those two things would stack on top of one another, especially given that when the creation story originally emerged in, in, the, in the form I talked to you about last week, the story of Adam and Eve, the idea that the serpent in the garden was also something that was associated with the adversary wasn't an implicit part of the story. That got laid on afterwards. It's like, well, what's the worst possible snake? Well, that's a reasonable question. And then a better question is, what do you do about the worst possible snake? And one answer is, you face it. But there's other answers too, like you make sacrifices, right? And that's how you stave off the dragon of temporal chaos, roughly speaking, is that you learn to conceptualize the future, you see the future as a realm of potential threat, and then you learn to give things up in the present, and somehow that satisfies the future. 